So let's first start with five big changes. Um, one, the explosion of media channels. If we're all not suffering this, especially uh, in this election season, um, I think this is the best example of so many different media channels, so many things to focus on. Ultimately, how can you dive in and focus a little bit more in this explosion of media channels to break through the clutter and reach your audience? Um, two, we live in a multi-screen world. Um, if this isn't the case, here's some data on time spent across screens. There's also a lot of transition um, between these screens where multiple devices are being used at the same time. So you have to think about your story on one device as well as the other device and those two being used together. Um, there was an interesting stat. I was listening to uh, NPR while I was uh, driving this morning. It took a little longer to get here, so I was able to finish the story. And they were talking about families actually coming together again in the living room. And ultimately, um, surrounding one device for the first time in a long time, and it usually had sports with it, so a good time to be in the Bay Area and focus on sports. This last weekend was crazy. But it's also um, interesting to watch the dynamics in the living room because we're not all focused on one device. We're focused on multiple devices, even though we're in the same room. So um, we actually call it device isolation, where you're a little bit focused on your one device. Um, and you're not focused on the conversation or the family around you. And, and if you go back and look at old images of the family living room, everyone was um, glued to the TV because there was one device. And that was the only way that you could get your information. Three, every company is a media company. And I think this goes for you as individuals um, and companies in general. You need to think about how you're representing yourself, how you're representing your image, and ultimately how you're telling your story as a media company. You can drive very specific stories. Um, in this example here, Charles Schwab and the corporate Twitter channel, Shell is a good example of their website. Shell spends more time telling upstream stories versus downstream stories. So where you have the upstream and the downstream, it actually changes at the pump. So consumer facing is downstream. And then upstream, there are a lot of different stories to be told with NGOs and other organizations. So they spend a lot more time visual storytelling upstream of the gas pump. And I think it's something to watch. And then if you look at this, this is a great app um, done by Ben & Jerry's. So um, has anyone ever seen this app? Anyone ever tried it? So great use of augmented reality. So you can go and download the, uh, the Ben & Jerry's app. And if you scan the topper of one of the containers in the freezer in the store, it will actually provide you with supply chain information on that specific container. So you can talk about ingredients, where they come from, and ultimately how you would um, dig into telling a better story about a particular pint of ice cream. And you can do it at retail, which I think is pretty interesting. There's a lot that you can do with um, QR codes, barcodes, you can do a lot at retail now that you couldn't do before. So when you think about your media company, think about it from not only your website, but also from your mobile devices as part of telling your story. And there's a lot to do here in social as well, and we'll dive into that in a second. Um, so stories are social. I think if you look at the, the screen here, you'll see some consistencies on the left-hand side. And then I threw in a few here, Instagram and Pinterest. I think you'll see some of these platforms change over time. And everyone is talking about the platform. I mean, if you looked at all the, the platform logos on one slide, it's, it's quite overwhelming. So don't think about social specifically by platform. Think about how you're ultimately trying to reach your audience then go to the platform and ultimately select the right vehicle. So these are all vehicles to reach an audience. It goes back to um, the, the 101 in direct marketing of ultimately, where's your audience? Where are they most likely to receive your message? Spend time there first, but always test and learn. You want to look at these other platforms. If they fit your audience targets, make sure that you're testing and learning on these new platforms and that you're using them yourself so that you understand ultimately how they work and how they can help you target your audience. And then stories last forever. Um, so newsprint, the story used to go you know, to the fish market and ultimately be wrapped around fish and it was gone because that's the way it went home. Now stories last forever. So it's really important to think about what search is doing and how it actually affects your stories and how your stories can last forever. That can be a good thing and a bad thing and something you need to pay close attention to. So then three things haven't changed. Um, one, time and attention are finite. We're all short on time. Um, it, this is just every single day. Once you start to go through different life stages, your life's change, you actually become shorter on time. At least I think I, I have two um, young boys, three and a half and 11 months old, and that's where most of my time goes. And most of my time is spent trying to take my phone away from uh, 
my older boy who can uh, go crazy on that thing. Um, two, we love a good story. Really, really important to wrap your content in a good story for impact. You have to tell a story around it, otherwise it doesn't mean much. And if you're trying to cut through now, make sure you're telling a story around the content that you're creating. And then content is king. Um, it's really, really important when you think about content and you think about your content strategy, that drives ultimately what your digital strategy is, is based on content. Um, and we'll have a, uh, Vicky is going to email the deck and uh, some of the information around the, the deck as well. So know that you'll get um, a PDF of the deck. So uh, some of this data, all of this data will be in there. And then if you think about content, content is social. If you think about how content spreads, 23% of all social media messages have a link to other content. So think about that. Think about this as a vehicle and how you're driving folks to one of your own media channels using social media to amplify the conversation. But you also have to think about who you're trying to reach and can you reach them with this medium to ultimately drive that intended action back to where you want them to go. 42% uh, of all tweets contain links to content. Uh, I think one of the key things with Twitter is, is it allows you to consume so much information. It's really important to think about how folks are consuming information. If you're trying to drive a story, can you use Twitter to drive that story with a specific audience because they're browsing that content? And think about the effects on Twitter and then think about the effects off Twitter. A lot of media in this day actually scan Twitter for story ideas. So we try to use Twitter as a specific amplifier with media and targeting media for stories. Um, it's a good way for them to consume as well. Um, and this is pretty amazing. So 72 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. Um, it's crazy when uh, a few, I think even last time this has changed, it, this made this crazy jump from like 36 hours to 48 hours to now 72 hours of content are uploaded to YouTube every minute. When you think about this in history, that's actually more content in one day than like the previous 60 years of the three broadcast networks creating combined. Combined. It's crazy to think how much content this is. What it is, though, is a great way for you to push your message, but then also it creates more noise. Um, 250 million photos are uploaded to Facebook daily. Crazy, crazy numbers. So think about photos as part of your strategy, and you can't forget those. Um, so a lot of people say, why social? My, um, my thoughts on social um, go pretty deep on this, and we'll touch on some of those as social as part of trust and social as part of other things. I think the key here is to think about social and ultimately reaching your audience, but to think about social as part of your overall digital strategy. So social is one component of a digital strategy, and most of the companies that I work with now, um, we had a social media manager. So you have to have community management, but if you look at the way social rolls up into the organizations now, they roll up into a digital, social, and web person in most cases, and they're starting to more and more. So the way that, that social rolls into digital is part of the overall digital strategy, and think about it as such. It goes with your websites, it goes with your mobile apps, it goes with anything digital, and is one of those components. So um, this is the Edelman Trust Barometer, Barometer. This year was the 11th annual study. Um, we'll send this around afterwards so you have the, the summary results of this year's study. So essentially what we do is study trust on an annual basis. And if you think about trust, it's really important to think about trust and reputation and how they're different. So if you take a day like today, everything in the past was all about reputation. So thinking about what you've done in the past, that really leads to ultimately your reputation. And if you think about trust, trust is this point based on your reputation from the past and ultimately how those will perceive you going forward. So trust is almost a forward-thinking metric, and it's really important to think about that as you um, sit down and you look at some of the data here. And keep in mind, this is just data specifically, but I think we've got some interesting points here. So the trust barometer, we look at government, business, NGOs, and media, and ultimately how we drive trust in those organizations. So what you're seeing here is a lot of colors, and I'll make a few specific points, but again, you'll have this data to look at a little bit more. So that purple column is actually trust from 2011, and then the blue is trust from 2012. Now this is a sample of informed publics. So those that actually read the news, those that are educated, those in, in higher income, so top 25% of their income. And we've done this study of 30,000 individuals globally. This year for the first time we added general public. 
So your more general audience that doesn't fit the informed criteria. So you see that for this year, and this is the first year that we've included in that. So you can see some of the interesting comparisons. Where I'll focus in this one specifically is the trust in media has come up, which is really important to think about um, us having an opportunity from media. So you're your own media company. You can drive stories from your owned properties, and you can leverage media all throughout social. So if you think about trust in media, that's a good thing that we have going for us this year. Um, and then if you look at this, global, so um, we're skeptics now. So distrust is growing. If you look at the comparison here, so this is 2011 on the left-hand side. And if you look at trusters, neutral, or distrusters, so the amount of distrust in specific countries is rising. So the numbers are rising. Neutrals being squeezed, and then you can see the trusters from a company standpoint. So those are individuals that have trust inside of those specific countries. So again, the story is distrust is growing. There are a lot less, less neutral parties. So think about converting a neutral party versus converting a distruster. It's a lot harder to do. And then skepticism requires repetition. So if you look at this graph, um, and it's about the same year over year. So 2011 to 2012 hasn't changed this much. Um, four to five times is, has increased slightly this year. So um, in order to believe something or trust something, you need to see it between three and five times. So 63% of individuals need to see something between three and five times in order to believe it. And it's a really important point because you can't just see that information three to five times from one source. You need to see it from multiple sources. And this is where a third party for credibility comes in and is something to think about. And then one other piece on trust here. Um, if you think about the, those that we trust, so between 2011 and 2012, academic or expert still sits on the top. So for those in academia, that's really important. I think an important thing to think about as you're looking at spokespeople on behalf of your brand or you as an individual or you as a specific individual and where you fit into these categories. So point one, if you look at CEOs and government official or regulators, the drop in ranking in trust, the biggest declines in trust barometer history, and then if you look at the greatest increase since 2004, we've got regular employees, and then we've got a person like yourself. So what a better way to connect with a person like yourself than leveraging social media. And it just so happens that social media has seen the greatest increase here from 2011 to 2012 with a 75% increase in trust and social media as an actual source of information. So with all of that combined, any questions? I know it's a lot to take in all at once. But think about social and how you can ultimately leverage it for trust as part of this and how it fits into the bigger picture. Picture, excuse me. Um, so if you think about the social pieces, if you think about trust, if you think about that one key graphic here in needing to see something between three and five times, very, very important to look at the type of media and the new media ecosystem. So in that upper left, you've got traditional media. Those are your traditional outlets that we've all known for many, many years. If you move to your right, you've got hybrid outlets. And these are the digital properties of those traditional media sources. And then a lot of other new upstarts that have been around for quite some time. If you look at TechCrunch, if you look at Mashable, those are more hybrid outlets because they're, they're born out of digital and they ultimately do more to impact search in some cases. So think about hybrid as those that cross between traditional and digital um, as an important piece. Coming down to the lower left, you've got your owned property. So we talked about that, mobile entities, your websites. Moving to the right, your social channels. So think about your social channels. Think about social as something that some people refer to it as own, some people refer to it as, as many different things, but social is something where you can control the message, but you can't ultimately control the platform. So if Facebook makes a change to the algorithm, it can have a direct effect on how many people actually see your content. Does that make sense? And then if you look at paid, paid really sits as this um, floating entity in, and something to think about when you're leveraging a story, if you want to leverage and focus on a certain part of this. So if you want to focus on social, you can leverage a paid program in social now that will really amplify that message if that's the right platform for you to hit specifically. So paid and a paid media program can support all of these leaves individually. So you define own again, so own meaning like your own website. Correct. 
Yeah, so it's basically anything from an owned media perspective, and, and this is more of a digital stint. So it's your website, could be a mobile app, could be a blog. Um, blog actually fits in this little area in between because people can actually comment on your blog. So something you think about are the interactions that it creates. It's where you can ultimately tell your story. You control basically 100% of the message and how you're telling that story. So you, don't, you control the message in social, but you don't necessarily control the platforms per se or the type of content that you can actually produce. Does that make sense? So what a better way when you think about this, seeing something between three and five times before you believe it, um, and telling that story across some of these very specific outlets. So if you're going to tell something across ABC, Politico, and then you're going to post to your Facebook um, page because that's the right audience, you might actually consider posting the third-party endorsement in one of those articles about you as an individual or a company, and then you can ultimately drive that story home from your owned properties, or the story might start from your owned properties. So if someone is seeing something between three and five times from varying sources, much better opportunity to gain their trust. Um, and we'll dive into some of these individually here in a second. Two things in the middle of this, this diagram with the little circular piece. You've got search is the little magnifying glass. And then you've got visual content is the little play button. So video, infographics, images, visualizing your content is really, really important. Because if you look at the way technology works and if you look at the way individuals work, for the most part, Technology is crawling, Google for example, is crawling the under parts of your pages, right? It's crawling the title tags and the meta tags, and it's more technical. And ultimately, so your structure needs to be set up in the right way that your content can be indexed. Um, someone a long time ago told me specifically that, that Google really acts like a three-year-old. If you turn a three-year-old loose on a website, um, those with three-year-olds, if you see them on your computer, they're clicking like crazy. They click on every link. Um, they sometimes trigger um, advertising and they're caught in some other area where if they're going down and, and their experience comes to an abrupt stop, they ultimately, whoa, throw up their hands and they kind of freak out. They keep clicking a little bit more, but Google does the same thing so that you want to make sure that the technical parts of your websites and properties are set up in the right way, that they're being indexed in social so broken links and things like that can affect your social ranking. And then if you look at it from a visual standpoint, we as, as individuals and our, I think human nature are really attracted to images and videos. I think sometimes we also like to lean back and just watch things. We don't necessarily like to lean forward and read things. It just depends on kind of where we are in our mental state. So think about that as we go through the rest of the Cloverleaf. So a little bit more on making it findable. Um, so the search part of this equation. If you look at this, this is a blended results page. So there are two sections to this page, and essentially it's just a search on Google. Um, if everyone, did anyone see any commentary about Red Bull Stratos? The jump? Yeah. yeah. So the jump from 125,000 feet. I literally just punched in Red Bull Stratos, and essentially what you're seeing in this one search results page, you're seeing a little bit of owned, a little bit of traditional or hybrid. You've got some social in the form of video and Wikipedia. And then you see the Red Bull um, actual social pages come up. And then a little bit more social video from varying sources. And then some paid as part of the overall program itself. So if you think about blended results, one, blended results led to 30% higher click-throughs on a search result page itself. So by blending the results from many different sources, Google is getting a higher click-through rate, which is more important to think about that when it relates to search. And then if you think about this, and you compare all these little green callouts, they actually match the majority of the media cloverleaf. So th something to think about search and the impact on telling a story in the right way. Now, this is a pretty specific search. So this is Red Bull Stratos. Uh, obviously, a lot of the owned stuff is going to come up. Um, I thought that we would see more news in this. There was some traditional and hybrid news that popped up in a couple results. But thinking this through on how you're ultimately going to drive search is this visual content piece, which is this play button. So video and images rank higher. So this was a search metric study that was done last year. And essentially, the visual content is starting to take up the majority of the results. So this should be read as 60% of search results actually contain video. Um, in this case here, if you look at images second, so that's right around that 30% of images actually contain, or 
30% of search results contained images. So the visual content by very nature is getting a higher click-through rate and thus being shown more in search results, um, which makes sense. Think about mobile also um, as a platform. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's because all of the media covered it as like dunking face and all this other kind of stuff. The jump. And so and so when you think about that, how do you um, you know, how do you get content onto a page where people are actually talking about something that could match other search keywords or other search keywords or maybe like a different jump in page? Yeah. That is an excellent point, and that is what our folks do from a keyword linguistics standpoint when we look at search, is actually look at how folks are talking about the story, yeah. how they would phrase it. And I think that that's important um, for social as well, if you think about people using you know, Twitter as a tool or trend, trends on Twitter and that kind of stuff, and then if people really wanted to be trending, then instead it was probably just getting in your profile. Yeah. And I think that you can do a lot to start the conversation uh, trending on Twitter by actually kicking off what the original hashtag is as part of this whole program. So you can control some of that conversation by seeding what you want to use as the hashtag if you're the ultimate creator of that content. So it's important to think about that um, when you're creating your search strategy and ultimately how folks are going to seek out this content. You want to think in natural terms. You want to use the free tools. Google has amazing tools out there that are free to use. Um, a lot of them are geared at their actual um, paid advertising program, so don't be afraid to go in and look at the keyword tool uh, as part of Google AdWords, because that'll tell you what folks are searching for and how they're searching. They've got trends, so you can see how information trends over time based on keywords. So think about how folks are going to search for your content and then program it accordingly. I have to admit, when doing this, I did it more to actually show the types of results on a Google page. I should have put in a more natural language search um, that was like jump from space. Um, the, the funny joke that we kind of have around our offices now, it's like, so you want a really cool campaign? Jump from space. Like that's, the, the bar has officially been set very, very high. Um, actually 125,000 feet um, somewhere here or there. Um, so think about mobile. So LTE adoption and the ability to consume via mobile device um, and how content is delivered. In a lot of cases, you're not necessarily seeing the content on the mobile device because it might be a little bit choppy, it might be a little bit hit or miss, but you're at least hearing the content from the mobile device and if you're doing other things. It's almost like listening to the radio and watching TV combined. Um, consumption is going up though, so as, as the technology gets better, video consumption on the mobile device is going up. So something to think about when you're creating those videos and how will it play on the mobile device and ultimately how folks will use it. In some cases, you can't see video on the mobile device from some of the social platforms um, and some of the in images don't render properly, so think about that from a mobile standpoint. And then revisit your photo strategy with the rise of Pinterest and Tumblr and Instagram. Remember, all vehicles for viewing photos and if photos and visual imagery are a big part of your overall campaign and you have a natural ability to produce great content, think about photo as part of your strategy, then look at the platforms that are the best to reach your audience. Don't just do photos because photos are cool and they're easier to do in some cases. They can also be harder to do. And if you're expending a lot of effort to post photos across multiple platforms, if photos aren't the right way to reach your audience and those platforms aren't the right way, um, I, I encourage you to rethink your photo strategy and ultimately how you want to incorporate it. And then thinking about content that finds your audience. So Facebook, obviously very important in all of our lives. I, um, I have consolidated most of my activity to Facebook. There's this interesting mix on Facebook now between work and personal. There used to be a much divided line between work on other channels and personal on Facebook. Now it's, it's definitely starting to blur a little bit, which I think makes it more interesting for folks. Um, but think about how content finds you on Facebook. So the edge rank algorithm on Facebook is essentially what determines what you see in your newsfeed. So based on your interactions on Facebook, how many people you're interacting with, how many images you're clicking on, things that you're commenting on, things that you're liking, 
all of those determine what you see in your content. And if you pay close enough attention, your, your newsfeed changes quite often. So Facebook is constantly making tweaks to the algorithm in order to deem what is more relevant. Um, what we've seen over the last little bit here and, and what we've learned in talking to the Facebook folks, more visual content is more and more important. So photos and videos are becoming more important. And if you've seen the trend, it's actually text on photo is working very well lately. So thinking about this, um, we're working on a, a product called the Social Newsroom, which is essentially when there is a news event, we are quickly working on images that will work well with the news trend and that will increase engagement on the page, thus allowing more folks to see our content in their news feed because they're interacting with us as a brand. Um, one of the, the interesting pieces here, um, our team that works on VW, and, and um, we had to, to pull the picture, but essentially when the space shuttle came by, um, they had quickly photoshopped the 747 with the new Beetle on top of it. So they took the, the space shuttle off and they put the Beetle on it, and their Facebook audience was um, thoroughly pleased with that. And they have this crazy, vibrant following um, that, that would enjoy something like that. So it also has to be relevant, but timely is really, really important as part of that program. And then, I know a lot of individuals creating content. Don't let this really like overwhelm you, but when you think about creating your content, think about short form for social, long form for search. And there are varying types of content in between that have different visuals in it. Um, this will be sent to you so you can dive into some of the key pieces here, but if you think about search and social being a very important piece of this, you want um, smaller short form bite sized chunks that are visual in nature and then longer form um, is content content optimized for enthusiasts with search in mind specifically so there was a question earlier about how you create what types of content and what are you creating for the blog you could actually create that long form content from your website or from the blog that will index better in search if you're set up the right way and then you can create the more visual content as part of your social experiment um, and social test to see if folks are engaging with that content. So think about a spectrum of content when you're diving into your overall content strategy. Remember content strategy first, then think about the channels that you're focused on. Yes? So here, so the spectrum short form content, um, calendar for social. So it's important when you think about social, this will help you immensely. Think about putting a content calendar together. If you have vision into what's gonna happen in the next month, two months, three months, simply plot those in a calendar. Come up with a, a content calendar. There are tools out there. There's also um, Excel is great for content calendars. Just so that you can take an hour or two, think about your content calendar for the next three months. You know that you wanna post. If you know exactly what you're gonna post, create that content and have it set and ready to go. So when that time comes, it's a quick, easy post, and then you can spend more time thinking about the other types of content that would go with it. So short form content calendar for social, um, spike campaign content. So this is when you see that news story or something rise so that you're getting ready for those spikes in traffic that you would naturally expect out of the, the events occurring out of your control. Um, social poster content. Um, so this is visual content that ultimately drives that scale. So these are these social posters where you see a lot of words on the actual image itself posted and there's not a lot of text that goes with that. So can you quickly generate images that have a quote or that have a very specific um, topic and they're actually pasted right on the image itself? Um, visual content, I think we've talked about that enough, but if you have product imagery or product info, video content here and then long form content. And you'll get a copy of the presentation. Have you talked about a tool that you started using for a calendar? You know, there is a, um, there's one called Divi HQ, um, which is just an online tool for content calendars. Um, or there's another one called Kapost. Um, depending on how many people need to engage with your content, I wouldn't worry too much about a tool and put it into something that works for you. Even if you want to put it in your normal calendar um, or just a simple spreadsheet. But just think about moments in time that you have coming up. You kind of always can kind of tell what's going to happen in the next month. And if you're creating your content as a foundation, then you have more time to react to spikes in the news cycle or things that are taking place and you can create content for those specific instances if you're a little bit more planned out. So simple tactics like that will help you a ton. And then this is also to think about your approach to social. So this is just a sample approach and, and there are many different types of approaches. So this is that key point that 
if one, you don't have a lot of resources or staff on your team, or if you are an individual, think about how you're using the channels to target your audience. Go back to the 101. Think about, is Twitter the right channel to use to target your intended audience? Is it the right channel to use to amplify that content? So think about this. This is one example. So Twitter, in this case, is targeted at influencers and thought leaders. Um, smaller circle. We're targeting fewer folks, and the intended actions here are to engage with influencers and thought leaders. The difference between influencers and thought leaders, influencers have a larger audience online. Thought leaders have a smaller audience online, but could influence more people offline. Think about media when you think about this. And, and you get a lot of reporters not actually um, engaging or posting a lot to Twitter specifically, but they're constantly viewing and consuming information because it's such a great consumption tool. Um, and you can plant story ideas there. Then if you look at Facebook, um, 65 to 75% roughly of your Facebook audience, specifically as a brand and then you as an individual, are mostly clients. So think about your clients. If you have a passionate set of clients or followers, think about reaching your clients to then reach the friends of your clients that are potentially prospects. So you want to do a lot that's going to get your client base engaged or your friend base engaged. That is a better way to reach friends of friends, and it cascades from there. So think about that. Um, and then lastly, think about um, clients and prospects searching for information from YouTube. Um, we look at YouTube. It's the number two search engine out there. So um, if you look at that 72 um, hours of video created every minute, pretty crazy amount of content being created. Um, the best way to find and seek out content on YouTube is to actually search, unless you send a link to a video. Most people are searching for video. Excuse me, so think about posting all of your content in a nice, clean, organized way. Playlists are native functionality built into YouTube so that you can organize it, that if someone does land on your page, they can seek and find the content they want. But think about posting and optimizing all of the content um, for search. Just a simple tactic that you can use to optimize your YouTube content for search. Um, one simple tactic is to take the actual script. So if you're scripting a video, you can take the actual script and load it into the description of the video. And that way, you're optimizing all the text that's part of the script um, for search. Simple tactic there. Um, and then think about content. So you've got your content and your campaigns. Um, there are definite push content, push campaigns that you want to think about. And then think about research, insights, and engagement. And then your channels here um, are just vehicles, again, to reach your audience. So if you have a push campaign example, and you're trying to push a particular piece of content, um, YouTube might be the best place to do it. Push and post to that page itself, very specifically targeting that content there. Um, and that's one example. If you're looking for a little bit more research or insights, here you might want to pull from your clients on Facebook, if that's the makeup of your fan base on Facebook. And then you might want to reach into a discussion board or a forum or a community to get more feedback or research or insights from your audience. So think about what you're trying to do first and foremost, then select the channel based on that. You can get a lot more information from the paid platforms. If you look at Facebook Insights, what's your audience made of on the Facebook channel? So understanding that is really important, and you'll save a lot of time and effort if you're targeting the right folks at the right time with the right content. And then lastly, and then we'll take um, any questions, and I'll show you some, some pretty specific examples of work. So just remember that few create, most consume, the 1990 rule. 1% 1 create that content, 9% curate and share, and then 90% consume. Think, just think about the way that you interact yourself. And if it's something that's relevant to you, you're probably curating and sharing that information out to this broader base of 90%. Of um, we spend a lot of time in that 9% zone actually trying to target that 9% because they're curating information. And they're actually then sharing that information. And it's a better way to reach this 90%. Because in a lot of cases, with everything that's happening out there based on the five big changes, the explosion of media channels, it's really hard to reach those 90% that are just consuming that information. So think about the 9%. The and think about you as a 9% member as well. Um, you don't have to create all of your own content. You can curate content that, that is out there. And it's ultimately just part of the content ecosystem. If you're curating and sharing that um, that content, that's a big part as well. And you can reach your own audience, that 90% that follow you and consume as a big part of this. So with that, I say create and curate content worth sharing. 
the content piece is huge. It's the fuel of this whole impact in storytelling. If you're creating the right content for your intended audience, the rest just becomes tactical in ultimately where you're going to reach your audience at the right point. So think about the content you're creating first and foremost. And it doesn't have to be all your own. You can curate that content as well. All right. Any questions? I was curious what you thought of the current state of reputation management companies and how you um, interact with them. Yeah. Um, you know, we do a lot of um, spokespeople training by pure nature of us being a communications agency, and, and we spend a lot of time on reputation and, and ultimately driving trust and leadership. Um, I think there are tactical ways to manage reputation. Um, and there are a lot of services, services out there that, that um, offer ways to do it tactically, and there are technical ways that you can do it. I think the one that we see and hear most um, around the Bay Area is reputation.com. Is that like a service that you're talking about? Yeah, so um, there are influence and then there are reputation. So I would separate them into a couple different ways. So if you're managing a reputation specifically, you're a small business or even a, a large company with influential spokespeople, um, you can technically manage their reputation online um, via technology platforms, SEO, things like that. And, and you can focus on very specific platforms that rank higher in search results. Um, at the end of the day, it's content that will ultimately affect your search results. So creating content, creating the right profile for your individuals, and making sure that they have um, the right social footprint, if you will. So what does their LinkedIn profile look like? What are their other channel profiles look like? So that when they're being searched, they're finding the right information. So making sure that everyone's profile is up to date. And then ultimately creating content around their thought leadership piece is really important. So if you want to link a certain individual to a certain topic, um, to show thought leadership, you have to create a lot of content around that topic. Or if you have a um, reputation glitch, um, then you need to do a lot to honest, you know, push content down that shouldn't be appearing or that you don't want to appear in the search results. And you need to create content around that new topic to push the old content down. And that's lot, what a lot of the reputation companies do. They look at and they find those glitches, create, create content and optimize that content so that it shows higher in the search results. And then influence, I, I think there are a lot of different platforms out there, and I think that we're still in the early stages of, of kind of true um, algorithm to dictate influence, because I think influence is so important to context, um, and that you have to have thought leadership necessarily in a certain subject matter, but then you also have to have reach in that subject matter. So um, certain subjects may not index well online, um, and your overall clout or your overall influence might show much less than it is because you reach more people in the offline environment. Um, so I think the tools are interesting, and we use them directionally, um, but we don't use one specific tool. Um, we look at a lot of different tools, and there are a lot of great free tools out there that can gauge influence. Great. Any other questions before I show you something? A couple things? Okay. Um, and I know we're close on time. So this is uh, a client of mine, eBay, and these are very specific examples of visual storytelling. So um, a few years ago, we actually, um, and I will kick it off here, as soon as it gives me the play button. Oh, here it is playing, perfect. Um, sorry, it's not showing on my screen. So essentially what this is, is this was a holiday campaign a few years ago, eBay does a, a lot of business around Black Friday all the way through the holidays, and they can ultimately dictate what the hot product is of the year. So what you're seeing is an actual transaction taking place, um, specifically on Cyber Monday. Um, and this was a visual way to represent it. So we took every single transaction and mapped it um, based on zip code, and then displayed it visually as part of a thought leadership piece that you could see. Um, post Black Friday, so this was used to drive the news story around the transactions that were taking place and ultimately show eBay and the size of the eBay marketplace and how they can drive commerce. And this was online transactions specifically. So um, pretty complex here, and, and what we did is to actually drive folks to this, we filmed videos as soon as the data was available and ready. We filmed videos of the actual application itself working, and that's what you're seeing here. And then we used the video to actually seed the media so that you could see some of these transactions taking place. And you can see it was amazing to see the country light up starting from um, east to west and some of the uh, little transactions that 
that took place in Alaska there. Um, if you're a fan of The Biggest Catch, um, they were doing some transactions in Adak, Alaska, which is pretty close to uh, where they filmed The Biggest Catch. I know, it, amazing to see though, right? Um, so, and then the next iteration of this was more around mobile transactions. Um, so what you're seeing here, and, and this is just representative data, this isn't the actual data, I wanted to, to use this as a visual to show you, is specifically um, mobile transactions taking place in the eBay marketplace. So the next year, shopping via mobile device and the mobile commerce leader, clearly eBay, but clearly needing to drive stories around that and show the actual transactions taking place. And this is um, a, a similar application that took and plotted every single mobile transaction. So we did a specific holiday date selection of this data. And then after we followed up from the holidays, we launched the entire year. So we told two stories in this. We told the Black Friday, Cyber Monday mobile commerce story. And then at the end of the year, we told the eBay mobile commerce leadership story using the same infographic. So we literally plotted every single mobile transaction over an entire year. And then we allowed folks to use this dynamic infographic to go see and compare categories, to look at what was hot at any given time. So you could go in and see what was hot. You could see what was trending in the database. So we had mobile trends here that we would push into the actual application itself. So a unique way to visualize the commerce story and ultimately drive thought leadership. Um, and especially when you're looking at a holiday period and what's hot, everyone wants to know what that next Tickle Me Elmo is and ultimately um, what's gonna be hot that year and how can they get their hands on it. So it was pretty interesting from a consumer standpoint and also um, a media standpoint. They were externally, um, and we, we used those to actually drive the media stories. Mm -hmm. So what we, um, what we tried to do is, is drive the specific story with the visual, and then we wanted the media to come back and actually interact with the infographic, specifically with um, the mobile commerce infographic, which was a really important piece for us that year. So we wanted to drive it publicly so that folks would come back to the actual infographic and create their own stories. What we figured out is um, that folks weren't creating their own stories, so we started to use the infographic to seed stories in specific verticals. They were going back and looking at it, and we were getting a lot of traffic on the infographic, but we weren't seeing a lot of usage across the pages, so we started going in and using the infographic itself and sending very specific trends out to those individuals by vertical. So we figured out quickly, because we were measuring the process, what was being used and what wasn't being used, and we ultimately needed to push some of those stories out. interpreting it in a way that was a story. Correct. So you were seeding the story. So Correct. Let me tell you what this means. Okay. Yeah, and if you look at, and, and we can go back through it, so the compare tab. So could you create friction in a story between two categories? Um, one of the stories that came out um, this year was that video games were actually more popular than um, Valentine's Day related kind of love gifts, which I think it was interesting friction, that the number one seller on Valentine's Day were video games. <laughs> Um, so there's a little friction in a story that we used looking at this specific data and ultimately could figure out what, what created the friction or what created the story that then drove folks back. And, and we, after we started seeding some of these stories, we saw usage of the other tabs um, starting to become more and more on the infographic. Was this eBay technology on the back end? Or? Um, so this was eBay data, and then it was our technology um, on the back end and we built it. Um, what we're finding now is a lot of what you have to do with larger brands is there are infosec and, and obviously security requirements, so we worked very closely with their IT team and ultimately to um, basically house this platform and the data um, in a secure environment actually um, on the eBay servers. So it was internally, but our team worked pretty closely with them, very closely for a long time. Um, and the interesting thing to think about things like this is resources. So. We're talking about transactional data. The day after Black Friday, Cyber Monday, the weekends, and, and thank goodness we had an analyst that was so fired up for the projects that he would wake up first thing in the morning, basically from Black Friday all the way through the end of the year every single day and run a batch file of the previous day's data, scrub the data, and then send it to us and then we could use that data to post. Um, that's a good question. We actually never asked. 
I know. So maybe he had done it the night before, um, or as he was looking at what's hot um, in the data he was buying. Yeah, exactly. So it was pretty funny. So definitely a little bit time intensive um, from a resource standpoint, but it, it was a very specific story that we continue to tell for eBay as the mobile commerce leader, and they have since grown this story. Um, this was last year, no, year before, um, 2011. So something um, to think about. And then thinking about tweets. Um, so this was the tweet to launch the VW Beetle. Um, creative tweet, but this was actually um, a promoted tweet that we did as part of the launch. Promoted tweets on Twitter were just becoming popular at the time. This is still the number one promoted tweets from an engagement standpoint. So a piece of content can go a long, long way. I think, what's that? Oh, you can't read it? Um, the 21st century um, VW Beetle was just revealed. Check out the revolutionary new take on an iconic design. And then it was specifically driven to a page that housed the launch of the Beetle, and it was surrounded by an event. But this was one of the first promoted tweets um, for VW and was still one of the most successful promoted tweets that, that we've seen on Twitter. So knowing the right time, if you're going to take a big swing at something, having the right content, and then ultimately having the right played pa paid platform behind it. Um, this thing had a 53% engagement rate. Um, and then we had five subsequent tweets that had 44.4% uh, engagement rate, which is, is high and still the record engagement rate that they've had with Twitter. So don't be afraid to amplify a really good event piece of content with a paid product that, that will work really well. And does that, when you talk about the engagement rate, does that combine <coughs> like retweets and, and shares with clicks and likes? Correct. Correct. So it's clicks, retweets, and shares of that content. So then what's a good average engagement rate? Um, you know, I think it varies, but anywhere between 5 10% engagement rate is, um, I think, pretty darn good. And we see it mixed and depends on the content. Um, and it's amazing what you can see content do over time. So if you have a, a lot of brands have a, a brand protection program on Twitter where they've got a constant paid program running on very specific brand keywords. And you'll see different types of content actually spike the engagement rate. And some content is just continuing and ongoing. So there's this interesting mix now of paid products and brands buying competitive keywords. So for the most part, brands now have an ongoing brand protection strategy around their specific keywords, similar to what you would do in search. But looking at the different types of content, you get spikes in engagement rate. So everything runs somewhere in that 4 to 6%. And then if you're getting a 5 to 10% spike, um, when you see a, a valuable piece of content, valuable in quotes, then you're seeing the spikes in that content. And this is to watch. Um, it is in the paid platforms. Um, so you can do a lot of research on, on engagement rates specific to your areas. There's more information published on this. But part of the test and learn program with paid is you actually get a lot of rich data back um, from the advertising platforms. Um, so as those, those platforms get better, you're getting richer and richer data. There's this interesting merge right now between um, social and paid, and the data is getting so good in the paid platforms that I think um, you're seeing this shift where we've always had really good data in display advertising from the ad serving platforms. Um, now we're starting to see a lot of that application of technology come into social, which will only help us get more accurate in the paid programs. The beauty is, though, is if content is the fuel, we can see what content's working much more quickly and update that content. So, make sense? Um, how are we doing on time? Five more minutes? Okay, great. Um, so, a couple more here. So, this is the year in the like. So, this was in celebration of um, Microsoft's millionth fan on the Facebook page. Um, and let me see if this will actually work for me. Uh, I'm not connected. Um, we'll have to show this through, but essentially what this is, is you actually could go in, um, log into this application, and it would essentially display the last year of your Facebook data in images and text scrolling across the screen, and you had a scrolling timeline down here, so you could see where I am mid-year, and it would come across the screen, and you could actually make a movie and post it to your Facebook page. So you could make a, a movie of your last year on Facebook, um, which was pretty cool. So I know people are laughing. You got to be careful with those, uh, those movies um, if you have some friends like I have out there. But um, you could make a movie and you could actually select those that you'd have engaged with. So you could hit a drop down and you could select co-stars of your movie 
and you could go in and select those individuals and it would display more content around the engagements that you had, which I thought was pretty interesting. And this was all done in celebration of the millionth fan. Um, and this was more of a campaign application and then the campaign ac application has actually come down. So thinking about when things can go up and be reused and then when things would actually come down and you go back to your more normal programs and you look at those energy moments for the big hits. So if you've got your millionth fan coming up or your thousandth follower or you know, for those of us that, that don't have a ton of followers, you know, think about your 700, 800 and things like that that you can actually do for your fans and your following and give things away or show some way that you actually love them. Um, our Creative Suite team at Adobe actually um, did a little whiteboard drawing of all the, the icons that are part of Creative Suite and wrote a little handwritten note on a whiteboard, took a photo of it and posted that and it went crazy. Um, the engagement rate was really high on Facebook. So it doesn't have to be super high tech to be effective based on your audience. Um, here's a couple interesting takes. So um, Levi's Shape What's to Come. This was um, a problem that was identified that mentorship for young females was lacking um, in the United States specifically and globally. So the Shape What's to Come community actually paired um, mentors and mentees as part of this overall program in a community for young women um, and showing the need for mentorship. So approaching this in a, a different and unique way and all the topics were more around mentorship than anything else. Um, and then if you look at another community, um, this is a Pinterest page for AMD. Um, who thinks Pinterest is a good idea for AMD? Does it make any sense? Oh, so AMD, that, that might help. So AMD competes with Intel, um, and they make um, processors and chips, um, graphics chips as well as um, CPU chips. And essentially, um, they have a crazy tech mom following. Um, so Pinterest made perfect sense for this, and, and one of the, uh, the folks on our team um, proposed the idea, and we looked at engagement rates for specifically this tech mom community and the relationship that AMD had already had with this community. So Pinterest made perfect sense, and they have a great Pinterest board running that, that still continues to grow and grow and grow. It's following, but it all started with a small, influential group of moms that were interested in technology. So. And then last two, first, um, I know these are small, sorry about that. Um, so HP um, was the first to actually do a live stream on Twitter. Um, so when Twitter upda updated the brand pages um, to the new format, you could actually pin a video or a live stream to the Twitter page. So folks could actually watch the live stream. Does anyone know who Tiesto is in this room? So he's a DJ. Um, I didn't know before this program, but he is, he is a DJ, a very, very popular DJ that, that plays to millions of people every year. Um, pretty amazing to watch him. So technology is a huge part of his overall show himself. So as part of a launch at CES of a new innovative product for HP, they culminated, culminated the entire show in a live stream on Twitter from CES that they had um, an invite only list to this venue in Vegas where Tiesto played and then it was broadcast to the world via Twitter, which was pretty amazing. So the first ever live stream on Twitter. Um, and it was interesting because um, the conversation was being monitored while the show was taking place. And it kept coming up that the geeks don't know how to dance and that they're not that engaged and not dancing. And it looked like they were having fun, but, but not dancing. Keep in mind, this is a like rabid Tiesto following that is now looking at this from all over the world. And the one comment was that people weren't dancing. So they were feeding this into Tiesto as he was playing. And he was putting on the boards behind it like dance and, you know, and jump and up, you know, applause and all that kind of stuff that got the crowd going more. So pretty interesting take that he's calm, cool, and collected to see what's being broadcast on the screen coming into him um, and then actually tweaking the show accordingly to get the folks more engaged. Pretty, pretty cool. Um, and then one last thing for eBay here was um, specifically around images and a lookbook. So a lookbook is where you can flip through and look at different looks that are usually uploaded by users to the site specifically. This is one where we enabled users to take a picture of themselves, upload the photo, tag what they were wearing with very specific categories, and then ultimately made their photos shoppable. So this was the first shoppable lookbook where folks could upload their images, tag all the clothing, and then if you went to one of these images and you were flipping through and scrolling through the images, you can click on one of the pieces of clothing and it would take you to a shopping results page on eBay where you could specifically buy whatever that style was that that 
person was wearing. Um, and this was supported by uh, a few different things, but we had on the street photo shoots, we had um, a crazy number of, of photos submitted. We had um, 43,000 votes, we had 1,600 photo submissions to the site, which um, creates a lot of great content. But the key was it creates a lot of great shopping opportunity for eBay. So folks were uploading, tagging, going through the process. Um, there was a contest component that drove engagement and entries, which was really important, but you could actually shop from the photos themselves. And that is it. I am talked out. I would definitely take a few questions. Um, take two questions? No questions? I've completely overwhelmed you and stumped you <laughs> with too much information. Start anywhere. Yeah, right here, Brenda. Uh, you mentioned um, kind of the thing about a handwritten something, but the giveaway doesn't have to be big. It was a handwritten something. I just wanted you to clarify that. And then just talking about the role of contests and, and how you, I mean, you touched on it briefly, but just yeah. the role of contests and how you would go about that. Or okay. how, how big is that? How big are contests and building on it? Yeah. So the, um, the handwritten note was in celebration of a milestone on a social channel. And the team actually had um, hand drawn on a whiteboard with the pens, essentially the, the Creative Suite um, icons for the Adobe Creative Suite. And they wrote, you know, thanks to all of our fans out there, we've just reached a million. They took a picture of that whiteboard and then posted it to their Facebook page. And the engagement was, was really great because they had gone through and, and literally sketched out all of the, the, logos and the, the logos and icons for each one of the Creative Suite products and then put a handwritten note on it. And it was really authentic because it was a whiteboard on the side of someone's cube in a hallway and you could see all of that. So it wasn't this perfect, perfect image. Um, it was a good image and it was really creative and really thoughtful. Um, so it got high engagement based on the fans really liking that part of it. So, so. in the contest, so uh, how big of a deal? I mean, how, how much of that is driving you know, Facebook likes and everything? I think that's a big part of it, and I think there's this delicate dance between um, a contest ultimately driving submissions or likes of a page, and then getting true engagement. So if you are launching a contest as part of a program, they work well, they can really, really um, get you a larger following, and you can watch spikes in metrics after you kick off with an actual contest as part of a campaign. But what you need to pay close attention to after you launch a contest is the um, unlike rate. So you can see that as part of Facebook. So you might get a spike, but you also might get an unlike rate um, that would net net not be that good for your page or the brand page. So I think test them. They definitely work. But make sure that you have content as part of the follow up, as part of the program that will keep folks engaged because you might see your unlike rate. Um, those that are there for your content and your opinion might unlike you as part of um, you running too many contests. So you could be doing more damage than good, but I think they're a great way to execute and it really depends on the audience you're trying to reach and ultimately what they're looking for. For people who are not, who don't have an element, yeah. do you have any contest resources? Um, there are great contest applications out there, like Wildfire is a great contest application. Um, you can run contests doing polls um, and ask people to predict the results. So it can be native into just what you create um, ultimately as part of the program. Um, and then where you just, if you're going to run a contest, just make sure that the legal guidelines are specifically posted on how folks are ultimately going to win. Um, there's this contest of surprise and delight, which is ultimately just doing things a little bit differently and reaching out into the community and, and occasionally surprising and awarding folks that are part of your following with um, either kind words or um, little prizes or swag or anything like that. So it doesn't need to be overly complex. And we do a lot of those contests and sweeps um, from our community management folks um, that are just creating them unique to their communities. It's not always some big blown out contest. It's mostly rooted in the community and a lot of folks are doing it at the community management level just as part of their ongoing programming. Yeah, yeah. Could speak. It's a little bit of a meta question, but in, in the importance of creating content, tone of the content. Yep. So we have, you know, documentary filmmakers, we have academics. So, you know, I often think it's the social media realm can be so whimsical, yeah. funny. Those are the things that often go viral. And yet there's sort of the brand of credibility of your academic or your more advocacy organization. So I wondered if you could just speak a little bit to just finding that balance or. 
Yeah, I think the one thing that you can never lose, we call it the master brand narrative. Um, so as part of the content strategy, you would write a master brand narrative, narrative that addresses your tone. And that tone needs to be maintained throughout. Um, so that even sits higher up in that hierarchy above your content strategy, that what's your master brand narrative and ultimately what you're trying to tell. Um, again, I think in this case, social is just one vehicle that once you decide to focus on a specific channel, how do you take that out of your master brand narrative geared at the audience you're trying to reach with the right tone? Um, so is it short form content? It's likely to hit and it's a 15 second snippet of the larger video that's ultimately gonna drive that. Um, so I, I would push back the tone thing ultimately to the master brand narrative and you knowing your audience and speaking to them in the same tone that you would, um, but then doing different things to get higher engagement rates, whether it's using imagery or videos or you know, snippets of the video. So, great. Any other questions? One more. Our organization has two major audiences, the upstream and the downstream that we're talking about. Yeah. And so if you have, if you're tweeting out and you're putting out a Facebook page, our challenge always is who we're talking to here. I mean, because we can only have, or do we, should we have two Facebook pages is my question. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we're talking to elected officials versus the people on the street. It's a very different message. Yeah, so if you're talking elected officials and the people on the street, I think to the point of, is Facebook the right audience to be talking to elected officials? Most likely not. Um, so if you're talking to the people on the street, then Facebook is a good platform to get to the right people. Um, and you can leverage your existing audience base to do that. I think there are different ways, to example, if you use Facebook and Twitter as a good example, you might be able to reach out and communicate with those elected officials via Twitter um, more than you would be able to reach out and communicate with them via Facebook. Um, so split your audience based on who's actually spending the most time on those platforms. My guess is the elected officials, um, in most cases, is probably going to be a one-to-one -one relationship in the way that you're speaking to them, but it's always hard to get an introduction to that one-to-one -one relationship. You might be able to start engaging with them on Twitter um, if they're an active user of Twitter as a platform. Um, and then get that opening to then meet them in person, become more recognizable because you've been engaging with them um, on Twitter as a specific platform. So the audience you're trying to reach, where are they most likely to hang out? And if it's Twitter for one and Facebook for the other, then you have to separate the two. Um, it, it's harder and harder to manage two or three or five or 10 Facebook pages. Um, imagine global organizations that are trying to reach out and manage audiences in 40 countries in EMEA. Um, Facebook is actually launching technology to help you do that. There are platforms that will help you do that. So Facebook has launched this global pages um, initiative now that allows you to have one Facebook page and based on the individual's location, they can come to a Facebook page for a specific country or a specific topic. So you can communicate to them from one page and create content specific to another location. So you're still managing one page, but it's got sub pages for countries and, and most likely, in this case, it's a global page that addresses individual countries. Now, how do you address specific audiences? You really need to think about the audience that's on the channel. Great. When you decide that you should actually go in for a paid platform, I mean paid part of the platform, I mean at what stage would one look at it? I think you should look at it at all stages because um, the, the balance with building a following and, and a program is that you actually need a following. So you can use paid tactics to actually um, target a following of the right types of users. That's the beauty about paid programs is you can get very specific in who you're targeting. Um, and ultimately build the right audience or the right following, then leverage that audience to continue to grow. Um, there's this theory of kind of paid and earned. So paid is the direct targeting approach to a specific audience, and then you get the earned metric on top of that when they share that information with their following, and that's considered earned or the, uh, the bonus um, to your spend, if you will, to pick up that earned audience. So I, I would consider it as part of the process, but I would also consider your master brand narrative and your content strategy before you even look at paid. Because in social, content is the fuel for your paid program. 
um, which is really, really important to think about. If the content's not good, it doesn't make sense to put um, paid against it. Um, so, all right. Oh. Where, where does blogging fall into any of this anymore? We don't have anyone blogging. Do we need sort of our thought leader or organization to, to be a blogger or um, they definitely are, and I know as we are a media company, we are definitely paying attention um, to bloggers and um, as part of our communication strategy. I mean, I think they still play this role, and they can really help you um, in the types of content. And, and bloggers are media, right? So it's a, a third-party endorsement of your brand. So there's a difference between you blogging and creating your own content, which falls more into the long form. And then if you look at this, the Transmedia Cloverleaf here. This can help inform the results. Um, so bloggers generally fall in hybrid and can be part of the targeting. Those that are third-party bloggers that, that aren't necessarily affiliated with you or your brand. Um, and then blogging as a platform for you fits here in between this crossover between owned and social because it's got a social component because people can interact with you. Um, so again, a blogging platform or a blog is part vehicle for your overall content strategy and the content that you're trying to, trying to create. If a, um, a blog is more flexible for you and allows your spokespeople to be more creative and, and isn't constricting, some um, existing websites are pretty constricting, then that's when you could consider a blog platform. And um, blogging is very important. It's part of the content creation cycle.